Welcome to Speak the Truth. My name is Gary Johnson. And today we're going to start off with I Remember 9 11. And on the website, there's an article written by Mr. Harold Bell uh, entitled I Remember 9 11, the day America discovered that freedom ain't free. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to start off with uh, Mr. Bell. And we also have CJ here who happened to be born on 9-11. So there may be some unique perspectives that he has. Yeah. Over to you, Mr. Bell. All right, yeah, we got CJ as our co-host today, born on 9-11, 10 years later, but uh, he was born on that day. Um, I remember 9-11 because I know exactly where I was. Uh, I was on the way, I got a ride from my, one of my neighbors to Ben's Chili Bowl that day because I was going up there to meet uh, Robert Brown. Robert Brown is a uh, is a still a promoter. Uh, I was uh, co-hosting a fashion show and hair show for him that evening at the MCI Center at the Sports Bar. So I was getting a ride up to Ben's Chili Bowl around ten thirty. I had a eleven o'clock meeting with Robert Brown, and as we riding up to go through the Third Street Tunnel, I noticed that there's some smoke coming from Pentagon City. So I told Gil, I said, look, Gil, there's something's on fire at uh, Pentagon City. So we didn't make that much of it, and we didn't talk about it no more. And he dropped me off at Ben's Chili Bowl, and he headed back home to Southeast. And I, when I went into Ben's Chili Bowl, everybody was all excited. Hey, Harold, did you hear that they just, uh, the terrorists just ran into the Twin Towers in New York City and Pentagon? I said, Pentagon? <laughs> I said, I just saw smoke. He said, yeah. So anyway, I called Robert Brown. I said, look, man, don't come. I'll go back home. I'll talk to you when I get home. So instead of going, you know, the subway is right directly in front of Ben's Chili Bowl. I started to go to the subway, and it hit me that the terrorists may be attacking the subway. So I jumped on the bus and took the, uh, I think it was the 50 bus that took me back to the armory in front of the stadium. And I took the subway one stop back to Potomac Avenue, got on the bus, and I was living at um, Suitland Road. And um, yeah, uh, Super Suitland, Suitland Road and Marlboro Pike, I think it was, I was living at the time. And I got off there, I was home free. So I called Robert Brown, and uh, of course, uh, Robert and I uh, had to make some changes. As I said, Robert was, was big time then, he was uh, promoting shows. And he was doing a fundraiser for kids in trouble that day. So I know exactly where I was. And I'm, I think I did not send Robert Brown the link to, to Zoom. That's why he's not here. But what we want to do, you know, so much, so much is going on. And we are such in, in a state of confusion. And I'm thinking about, you know, who is going to, to uh, heal America? And I thought about what about the babies that were born? Uh, they lost parents and stuff during, uh, during that time. And so I want to hit this little piece on uh, the children that were born. Uh, to an image, uh, something that people will never really forget uh, about 9-11. And we're talking about uh, the babies of 9-11, if you will. There were so many women, so many moms pregnant when they learned that their husbands would never come back home. Unimaginable. ABC News anchor Diane Sawyer with a preview of tonight's special, 2020 special, on the remarkable story she first brought to all of us 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we set out on Mission Impossible. 63 tiny forces of nature unleashed in one room. For a nation reeling after the towers fell, they were 63 reasons to believe in the future. But could we possibly corral them into a photograph? Let's move them in fast. They squirm. All right, do you think we have a shot in the world? <laughs> I don't think so. They howl as their little friends look on baffled. We need one more car seat. They tumble. Fall in love. Oh my goodness. And they go rogue. Finally, we get it. I'm holding a twin in each arm. And those twins, 20 years later, they were suggesting that they pick you up. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and here they all are now. 
The Crawlers, The Howlers, Tumblr One, Tumblr Two, all grown up today. Nobody's falling out of their chair. That was so hilarious. Not for you, perhaps, but for us. And I began to get an immediate answer to one of my questions from long ago. Would these babies who never met their fathers end up looking out through his eyes, smiling his smile? It's Jenna and her son Gabriel. That laughing little boy now towering over me. I'm sorry, I have to just gawk. It's really too amazing, isn't it? It is. It's been, all these it's been... years. So many mothers teaching us about the gift they gave their children, knowing that dad was never far away. I came up with a little kind of thing that we did together. You know, where does Daddy Jim live? And he would say, in heaven. And who does he live with? The angels. And when you want to talk to Daddy Jim, you close your eyes and look inside, and he would say, my heart. Mona, Mona. Where does, where does your dad live? Heaven. Heaven, and who does he live with? God. And who else? Angels. Angels. And when you want to talk to Daddy, you close your eyes and look inside to where? And where's your heart? Oh, yes, that's nice, love. Daddy loves you. Baby Jack is now 19 years old and grateful for the mother who tried so hard to help him keep his dad close. I just appreciate everything she's done because she's like the strongest person I've ever met. Yeah, really appreciate her. Thanks, buddy. I love you, buddy. I love you. So many beautiful, bittersweet stories that you can hear so much more of them. So many of them. Yeah. How about wow. that? Yep. The babies of 9-11. Uh, and, you know, when I look back and I think about the real heroes of 9-11, I think about the firemen who were real heroes. They lost 343 firemen, man, in that building, who went in that building and did not come back out alive. They are the real, real heroes. And joining us today is a, a dear friend of mine. Uh, we go way back. Uh, well, for four, over four decades, he has been the voice of the Caribbean Islands in Washington, DC. He has provided uh, them with incredible music, legacy, while engaging legendary artists, activists, athletes, educators, and a fascinating radio conversation on 89.3 WPFW. He is the author of Voices of, Pi of Pan Pioneers of Trinidad and Tobago. And here's a guy that gave me a platform when I didn't have any, you know? So when I, when I was awarded, uh, uh, what, what was that? The National Association of, of Black uh, Journalists Award uh, for 2020, I called him and I told him, I said, man, I could not have done this without you. Just like Gary gave me a platform with Black Men in America. Uh, this guy gave me a platform uh, on, on his show, um, you know, once a month or twice a month to allow me to get my message out. So I would like to welcome, this is the first time I ever interviewed him too. As long as we've been knowing each other, I've never had an opportunity to interview him and thank you. I'd like to welcome the one and only Vaughn Martin. How you doing, Vaughn? <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> this guy had every opportunity to kick me off the show a lot of times because I, I, you know, I could get beside myself, but he hung in there, man. Thank you so much, Vaughn. And um, I want to congratulate you, man, on the great work that, that you've done for decades, man. I mean, you've been the voice of the Caribbean. You're not only the Caribbean, but for those of us native Washingtonians, man, you, you, you've inspired us. So you definitely inspired me, man. So I wanted to take this time out to, to say thank you and, and say, you know, bring us up to date, man, on, on the things that you're doing and on the book that you had written. 
tell us tell us a little about Vaughn Martin and, and your your legacy and your great family uh who's been there with you step by step right 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 I tell you um I think that there's the, the woman who's sort of been my backbone is my wife Brenda and um when I first started she didn't at first see it but after she saw the reaction and people she became my my greatest support system and continues to today um and has passed that on to my children who also gives me encouragement and support to advance my daughter Vanetta and my son Rick um, mm -hmm. like Harold says that I've been around for over 40 years and um, one of the things that spurred me into getting into radio was to to give people a sense of who we were as a Caribbean people, as black people in the Caribbean. Um, you just didn't have black people in America, but you had black people in the Caribbean, in Africa and in other places. So I started to do radio, you know, um, interviews. One of my first interviews was Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, uh, you know, and to see a commonality within her and us and we realize that um, we are all from the same same place, you know. So I just continue to do it, you know. Having done so many interviews, I have a ton load of tapes. My house is like an archives. I decided to begin to write. And so I wrote the first book. I'm working on my autobiography now. And then I have other books that I plan to write in the near future. Um, the, the whole thing is that we as a people have to come together. Um, we have to learn of each other and work together and support each other. And it's so important that um, programs like yours and Gary's, you know, uh, is around to do what it did, what it has done. You know, my experience of 9-11, I was working at the OAS, the Organization of American States, and I was getting ready to go to work and changing my shirt and looking at the TV at the same time. I saw this plane just go whack into the the trade center and i said brenda brenda look a plane just hit a building and then by the time i said that the other plane went in and hit the other building and then the announcer was stupidified he you know he was talking i think ken jennings or peter jennings and i mean it was so flabbergasted as to see what has happened you know and i mean i immediately began to collect material and information i did a special program on this and what we decided, and in fact, just recently in doing it again in a 20 year tribute, it, it seems as though um, it was only American people that lost their lives. And I realized that no, it wasn't just American people, it was a combination of peoples. Although 2,800 people died, amongst them were over 600 immigrants, mm -hmm. people from different islands, Guyana, Grenada, the smallest island, Dominica, all these places. And these people lost their lives in this 9-11. And that is what we focused on this Saturday, you know, to remember them, that they contributed to this, uh, this mess that occurred um, in, in, our, in our lives, you know. So, that's that's where we are that's in a nutshell you know you know um i would like to say i would like you know to bring this back a full circle and we talk about oh yeah robert brown is not here it's not because uh i forgot to send him the link uh he had problems with his computer so hey he's not here so thanks thanks again robert brown but we'll bring you back here but what i want to do now i want to I want to talk when I talk about the young people, and I always, all of you know, young people is what it's all about with me. That we've got a young man right here, uh, Christopher, who was born on on 9 11. You know, he's 10 years old, but now he has become a, a, a guy that has been uh, making a contribution on Black men in America and on Zoom here on Zoom. And I want to get uh, Christopher's uh, some kind of idea where he thinks we are as far as Americans and where are we going from here? Uh, I've, my thought is that the young people that were born, you know, of, of those people who died in, in, in the World Trade Center at the Pentagon, those firemen that lost, that they lost their fathers that went into the building, they were born, they were came about about then. Can they be uh, the key to healing of America, uh, Christopher? And happy belated birthday, Christopher, yesterday. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, 
can they be the key? It's, I think maybe, but um, I think the sentiment from the younger generation is, is a lot different than what it has been. That sentiment of patriotism of, you know, everyone coming together is kind of eroded after we've seen what has happened in the subsequent years with the Bush administration, the Patriot Act, the torture, the, uh, as was stated before, it wasn't just American lives lost because of this, even um, subsequently after that, it was hundreds of thousands of Afghan, you know, Afghani lives and lives of our allies and lives of, you know, more than just American lives and wasted American lives as well. And what was it all for? As we see, um, Joe Biden just brought us home from Afghanistan and um, took several um, media backlash for it, but mm-hmm. it, it showed that um, 20 years later, in the longest war, some of those kids that fought in that war weren't even born uh, in during, you know, 9-11. So that's how long it's been that we've been trying to avenge that. Osama bin Laden has been dead for over a decade, and we, we are just bringing our troops home from this conflict. So we see, you know, it's kind of hard to look back on that with the, the patriotism that everyone saw it when we saw how fruitless the efforts were subsequently that, that it led to. So it, it's a very different different sentiment also it it kind of radicalized a lot of younger people to see you know george bush to see our government not necessarily being the good guy you know when i was younger i didn't understand i just it was just like oh i was told these these bad terrorists from somewhere else want to just they just hate us because they hate us but as you get older and you realize the nuances of our politics and our military industrial complex and you know some of our role in creating some of those messes in the middle east it's really hard to to keep that unity and that patriotism when we saw a lot of it was for, you know, for nothing or for to line the pockets of the military industrial complex. George W. Bush was hailed as a hero, but he's, you know, turns out he's a war criminal. The same with Cheney and all those other people, unconstitutional terror, um, um, unconstitutional torture. There was all types of things with the Patriot Act, which um, took away a lot of our rights as Americans in terms of NSA spying, Anyone they deem a terrorist, you basically have no rights. And like, that's problematic now, years later, the, uh, what they've used some of those provisions for. So it, it's, a, it's a deep legacy, but it, it's a one that is ultimately one of failure and one of, I don't know, definitely deep skepticism of our government based on what we were told. We were lied into these wars. The mainstream media lied us into these wars. And then years later, it was like, oh, our bad. Oh, I guess. They didn't, there were no weapons of mass destruction or, you know, there was this and we're, it, was, it was just a lot of that. So, yeah, that's why um, these wars don't poll well with the American people now. That's why people are they see that we should be using those resources here at home to be rebuilding our, our communities here. Flint doesn't have clean water and things like that. Yet we're, we're yet we're over here bombing Kabul or something like that. And that's just not where the American people want their tax dollars to be, regardless of how you felt about Joe Biden's execution about leaving that war and ending the war it needed to be done and it was never going to not be sloppy because we shouldn't have been there in the first place mm-hmm. sydney good morning sydney where were you sydney where were you on 9 11. you gotta unmute yourself sydney Still can't hear you. Still can't can't hear you, Sydney. Okay, Gary, why don't you come on in then? Then we'll we'll come back and get Sydney. Gary. Well, I can tell you, I was um a, I was a consultant. I was in the air flying about ten days a year, and um, I had just dropped CJ off at school, and I'd come back home to pack because I had to go to Atlanta for a seminar. And uh, I was packing and watching the TV and I saw the first plane hit the building and I'm like, whoa, never saw that before. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of slowly packing because my flight was like, you know, 1130 a.m. And uh, took me like it took me like 30 minutes to get to the airport. Then when the second plane hit, I was like, "Okay, this ain't no accident. Um, I'm probably not going to be going anywhere. And sure enough. I called the company, it was Cox Communications in Atlanta. And uh, they're like, by then they had started bringing planes down. So I knew then. And then I, you know, I just kind of like everybody else, stayed glued to the television. And CJ School was close to Andrews Air Force Base. I didn't know if they were 
going to shut, I mean, they had shut everything down in that area. So I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to pick him up, but I was able to pick him up. And I don't even know, CJ, if you remember this, but he got in the car and I knew it was his birthday. And I just said, so before I could even say anything, he got in the back seat of the car and he said, some birthday, huh, dad? Some birthday. Mm. We got Sydney off of mute. A little echo there, Sydney. but let's see. Sydney, can you, uh, are you off of mute? Can you talk? Yeah. Okay. Where were we? Oh, nine. oh Sydney's got two. He's up on two places. That's why we're getting an echo. Oh, Sydney up on two places. Okay. What about uh, Brenda? Brenda, you okay? Sydney, are you there? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Sydney, up on two places. That's why you need to be back. <laughs> okay, now, now, Sydney, go ahead. Try it again. Keep it moving. Keep it moving, Al. Okay. Okay, he said keep it moving. Keep it moving. Brenda, you want to come in? Brenda? Okay. I see we got Deb. Uh, who is that? Who's Deb? Deb Lyra. Oh, nice. it's Deborah. Okay. Hey, Deborah. How you doing, baby? <laughs> Where were you on 9 11, Deb? Okay. Well, so I, okay. My name is Deb Lara and I was at work. So I worked at Arlington, Virginia. And um, we were all in cubicles and I could, we heard about the plane hitting. Um, and we had TVs outside of our cubicles. So all the employees went out and was watching. And at Arlington, we could hear the sirens at the Pentagon. And it was just over and over and over. And then we got an announcement that we need to evacuate the office and get home and take the train. And everybody was wondering, why would we take the train if there is terrorism, if there's something? So I hitched a ride with one of my coworkers and we were on 395 and it was total chaos and total mess. And it took me at least nine hours to get uh -huh. home. And it was just frightful because, you know, we really didn't get much information just, you know, about the, the whole incident. And of course we had uh, the radio and the news that was going on. Um, and in New York, my children's aunt, uh, she walked into the World Trade Center because she thought in New York, you know how they have a lot of movies and the planes were mm -hmm. flying. So she didn't think of anything. And then when she went into the building, um, she, everybody was coming out and she had to walk from there to Brooklyn and her whole body was filled with dust and debris and she already had asthma. Um, so it didn't affect her on that day, but it affected her her whole life. And because of 9-11 um, and the dust and the trauma, she passed away because of that. Mm -hmm. You know, so at 9-11, that whole time is something that I will never forget. And it has affected our whole family. All right. Deb, you could took you nine home nine hours to get home. Where were you living? In Atlanta? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was living in Heightsville. But the, again, you know, wow. it, ev all these cars were there. Nobody knew how to drive. No. I mean, everybody was still um, scared. And again, you know, it was too many people at the same time trying to go home. Right. You know, so. It was devastating. I, I I still remember the day just like it's today. Okay, Sydney, can you uh, join us now, Sydney? Sydney's still getting that feedback for yeah. some reason. for some reason. Okay, let's uh, let's kind of move on. One of the things that that I want to talk about not only uh, nine eleven and and how that was such a devastating, one of the deadliest terrorist attacks ever in America. But also, I want, I want to talk about uh, where we are now as far as Afghanistan. I mean, we went to Afghanistan 20 years ago, went over there to help Afghanistan people take 
you know, their country back or city back or whatever. And guess what? We leave 20 years later and the Taliban has taken over again. So I'm looking at 20 years that we wasted there where we could have been helping our own people. Now they're talking about bringing 95,000 Afghans back to the United States to house, to feed them. And we are in such terrible turmoil at this stage where people are trying to get back to work. COVID-19 is kicking butt. People are getting evicted from their homes. So, you know, I'm all of all for helping people. There's no doubt about it. But how are you going to bring 95,000 refugees or immigrants in here from Afghanistan? What kind of shape, what does that mean for American uh, uh, people? I was listening to a politician on Newsweek uh, this morning, and he was saying, well, you know, those people were with us for 20 years, so we got to look out for them. Well, Black folks have been with them for over 400 years, you know, and we still uh, uh, there's no even playing field. So I don't see, you know, how we're really going to resolve this issue. Uh, I'm saying, uh, I'm asking, uh, of course, CJ about young people uh, leaning in and trying to provide uh, some leadership here, but the old folks won't move out of the way. So where are we? Sydney, can you come in and respond to that? Oh, we still still don't have you. Okay, we still don't have you. Well, we can get CJ. Okay, CJ, why don't you come in? Where are we now? I'm, I'm listening to I'm, I'm a Martin fan, but he he was on um on one of those shows this morning and he put Governor Christie in his place where he should be, you know. And he said, Man, the problem that we have today, you know. You have to look at the Republican Party. You have to look at Donald Trump. So how do you feel about that, CJ? It's not just the Republican Party that, that's holding back progress because it's the Democratic Party that has the White House. They have the House. They have the Senate. They have, they have a lot of power and control right now, and they're the ones that won't get out of their own way. They have Joe Manchin. They have Kristen Sinema. They have ultra-conservative Democrats, and then also ultimately Joe Biden, who refuses to wield his power with with any sort of urgency at all, even as the pandemic rages, even as like I said, the evictions go up, even as all that. So not all that can be blamed on Donald Trump. Donald Trump's not president anymore. The Republicans don't hold all the power that they have over previous years, although they might get it back if you know the Democrats don't do anything to materially help people. As you said, the Republicans have no issue with wielding power. They'll aggressively and overreach in wielding their power when they have power with the Democrats don't seem to have that urgency and it's going to be consequences for that so yeah like we we should be taking in refugees but at the same time yeah it doesn't make sense when to take in all these refugees when you won't even take care of your people we don't even have health care here during a pandemic or well, people can't even afford to go to the doctor or the, the dentist is not uh, considered health care here for some reason or vision or anything like that mm -hmm. so even if you have health care you might not be able to keep your teeth that's a luxury now in america you know, people, half the country is poor. Half the country makes like $30,000 or less. That's half the country. And billionaires got increasingly richer during the pandemic. The, the CARES Act, all the rescue acts, even the pandemic aid that we were given was all conditioned on giving more and more money to billionaires and corporations and then giving the crumbs left to people to help. So that in income inequality is going to keep growing and it's going to keep becoming an issue. So yes, as you said, there's not a lot that young people can do unless the Nancy Pelosi's and the Joe Manchin's and the Chuck Schumer's of the world and the Mitch McConnell's get out of the way. They're the ones that hold the power. They're the ones in those positions. So you can't ask activists to do what the Speaker of the House can do. You know, they, they need to do that. That's what you're the Speaker of the House for. That's why the Democrats were elected to win the House and the, you know, that's why they voted for Joe Biden to be in the White House. So, you know, if they don't do anything, you can't blame it all on Republicans or Donald Trump and use that for every issue that comes up. Okay, Vaughn, how about coming in, Vaughn? What do you think about that, Vaughn? I, I quite agree with, um, with CJ. Um, you know, one of the problems you also face is that the same thing reoccurring again. Um, you know, the, the prejudices that the white people um, own and have is not going to go away just like that. 
we as a black people somehow have to find ways of coming together and collaborating and doing progressive things for ourselves um, and to link with each other to, to, to manifest positiveness out of our lives in, in a direction that will help, you know, um, not just depending on the young people or, you know, but we all as a people have to collaborating and um, fostering a positiveness in our direction. You know, um, I, 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 you know, we, we really have to be concerned that the same thing that happened on the 6th may happen again, you know. Um, you know, when you look, I, some years ago, the Washington Post did a story where it identified that white people, the white man, were concerned about his being marginalized in the society. And as he looked around and he saw the African, the Indian, and the, 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 the Latinos, and they are growing in numbers. Their numbers are overcoming him. It's a challenge. And um, it's coming to proof, you know. What we saw happened is a testimony of that. And if we don't watch it, it will happen again. So how do we um, progress? I, I don't have the answer. All I know what I can do in my own zone mm -hmm. and get some collaboration from Harold, from CJ and so on, and to emphasize what we must do. I think that's one of the steps that we have to take, you know? Okay. Sidney, can you take yourself off mute? Sidney, take yourself off mute. Okay. Hey, uh, I, see, I see that. Um, man's inhumanity to man. And it's a, it's a continuation of how we have been disconnected, no plan within our culture. And it's a continuation of a systemic, systemic annihilation of not only black people, but people, cultures of people that are being decimated by one particular culture. And so we continue to find the Pelosi's or as CJ was referencing, the same mindset is in place that are keeping these institutions live, annihilating people, not dealing with equity. They don't want to even begin to have a conversation about equity. The civil rights movement was a core demonstration to try to come to a level of equity and balance among cultures and to protect the interests of black people in this American way of life. We've yet to come to those particular type and kind of crisis that create conditions for how we think, how we embrace one another as men of principles. And so economically, if you don't have a bone in this culture, it makes it that much more difficult. So ultimately they don't, we can't be at the table discussing solutions if, if we are constantly being denied what makes us that much more. So as man's continuation in humanity, a disconnect from the ultimate God that created us all, and yet we don't recognize that so therefore it's not necessarily from a religious context but that we have no respect for those who continue to try to control all of the resources within this country and other countries you talk about afghanistan you talk about korea you see all of these things historically all these systemic Corruption is about somebody defending their humanity. And we have all of the artillery, so we destroy those. No one has a, a force of military to take from the land of other people. And these this wars are created for taking land, 
taking the resources and annihilating the people who try to defend themselves. Okay. Um, one thing that I want to bring to everybody's attention is Vaughn. I think Vaughn. I think Vaughn. Sydney, we're going to have to get you to mute because this that feedback is killing us. There feedback. we go. Thanks. Um, Vaughn brought it up that we're, we're, we're in a position to see another 9 11, man. We left out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan, uh, those folks over there, the, those militants, those terrorists, they must have thought that they hit the lottery. We left pickup trucks. We left uniforms, weapons of, of, of mass destruction over there. Billions of dollars of stuff where they could come back and use on us. Yeah. I mean, just, just stop and think about that. We are still in trouble. And, and, and when, I'm, when I just look around, man, and, and I, I see the unfairness, that the only time that we can come together is 9-11. We all they want all of us to be one. That's when we got to be one. But as soon as they get back on their feet, they forget all about that. But here's the thing. Here we go, Mr. Bell. Uh -huh. If we had another 9-11 today, we are so polarized, we cannot, we will not come together like we did 20 years ago. Wow. Because we are so polarized as a nation. We can't even agree. What can we agree on in this nation? We can't even agree on vaccines. We can't bring on, agree on poverty, on, you know, good health. Oh, my goodness. Can you see how it'd be so polarized politically? If we had another uh, crisis where we had to come to come together, it wouldn't be like 20 years ago at that New York Yankees game where everybody was, you know, all together. I just think it would be different because of the polarization. Well, you're right too, Gary, because like you said, we can't even agree on abolishing anti-lynching law. <laughs> we can't even agree on that. Here right now, they, they fighting the John Lewis voting rights bill. We got to fight for a voting rights bill all over again. <clears throat> and, and, you know, Folks always want to say, well, you know, black folks are always playing the race card. Hey, man, you gave us the race card. It's there. You gave us the race card. So here, I, I have never heard, you know, I, I've, I've heard of, I, I remember one athlete always saying about how much he loves America and this and that and that white folks did. Hey, man, I have never heard Muhammad Ali say he hate America. I see Muhammad Ali embrace everybody, man. Every human being. He was not against America. I am not against, I love this country. This is my country. But I cannot stand by the wayside and watch people, watch blood flow in our streets over and over again. Decade from one decade to another. And I've seen the decades. I've been here for, for 80 plus years. And man, a lot of white folks have helped me to be where I am today. I can't, I cannot say I hate white folks. I could Burt Randolph Sugar, Red Arback, Richard Nixon. So man, we got to come together as one. We got to find a way. It does not look like it's going to happen. In, in, in my lifetime. I saw a show on Dateline NBC this morning. You know, I always say that every black face you see is not your brother and every white face you see is not your enemy. Well, I saw, saw that this morning on Dateline. This brother had been wrongly convicted of murder. He and five others, over 18, they got, he got, 20 to 25 years for a murder that he did not commit. And for 18 years, he has sat in Sing Sing prison trying to figure out a way out. And he exhausted all of his appeal. He didn't know where he's going to get any help from. And guess who walked into the, <laughs> Sing Sing one day 
and start teaching classes. A Asian nun. A Asian nun. And she sat down and she kept, he kept telling uh, her his story, how he was not guilty. And she said, something must be something. She said, I hear this all the time. We hear it all the time. So what she did, she went to a white friend of hers who was a lawyer, but he wasn't a criminal lawyer. He was a corporate lawyer. He looked at the story, man, and he did this because of her, because she it was such a great judge of character. So he said, something is to this. And this guy took this, this brother's case, took his case, man, come find out the cops had railroaded him. They had railroaded him and five other people, man, for this murder. And they finally got it into court, 2012. The story just seen this morning. They got this brother released. And another sister that was they say was involved in the murder. So when you start talking about, you know, you know, hating white folks, come on, man. Because <laughs> hating Asians, we're all in this together. And that story on Dateline proved that. But we are so, we get so hung up on the dollar bill. Greed is what's killing us. Greed is what's killing us. So somebody else uh, want to come on back in, CJ? Uh, yeah, so uh, just like you said, it's this aggressive late stage capitalism that is uh, the root of many of these problems. Um, like I said, homelessness is a policy choice that we could solve. We, it's not like we don't have enough money. We sank, as you said, we sank in um, so much 20 years of money worth into uh, Afghanistan just to give the Taliban all of our old weapons. They're strolling around in our Jeeps and our tanks and RPGs. And like, so, so what was it all for? Again, as my whole childhood and birthday was ruined by this whole event and many lives beyond that and uh our civil you know a lot of our civil liberties were taken because of that and for what you know it, it's it's not like this is some pristine democratic government we walked away from it was the taliban you know taken over in like 15 minutes after 20 years of occupation so that's this is where we're at and um in terms of yeah we we just need to we need a new, we need to rethink our whole society in terms of if we want to last past climate change. I don't know if anyone saw that New York and a lot of other places were underwater this past week because of the climate change and all these places that continues to not be addressed that Exxon mobile lobbyists have known about since the 1970s that, you know, these, these policies would ruin our planet, but they kept, they, they're able to buy our politicians and to continue to do whatever they want to do to the planet. For short-term profit goals. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to, uh, Gary. I want you to go to um, um, a video that shows how uh, really this, this brother. We lost. We lost a great brother, and it's, it's a shame, man, that we lost Michael K. Williams, an uh, outstanding actor. But guess again, uh, it was drugs. A drug overdose took it. Took this talented brother away from us, and. He did a piece called Typecast, that how we are typecast. I want you to look at this piece. You think I'm being typecast? I don't know. I think this cat is typecast. It's a fucking cat, you know? Ain't got much choice. What if he moved to a new neighborhood? You know? Hung out with the poodle crowd, did poodle things, you know, become a poodle. Still be a cat, you know? But what if he convinced himself that he was a poodle and everyone else that he was a poodle? Wouldn't that make him a poodle? That's a good point. I mean, weird as shit, but that's a good point. And this whole metaphor is bullshit, yo. You hear me? You think everybody don't got a role to play, huh? You think a white boy could have played Omar? You think you could play a president? I could. And I think we've seen the last black president for a while. 
I'm just saying. I think you're gonna always be playing some version of Mike. Gangster Mike, old timer gangster Mike, southern gangster Mike. But I'm not a gangster. Everyone that knows me knows that. Self-denying gangster Mike. Look, I picked these roles. Me, I, I made this path for myself. Did you? Yeah, did you? Or did they choose you? You think we would be doing what we're doing if we had a choice? Huh? Face it, man, look, we from a certain type of people that come from a type of place that look a type of way. You know what that make us? Black. Typecast. If I were typecast, I'd be in jail or dead. But I'm here. I got out. Got myself out. You sure about that? Yeah. Woo! Boy, that was powerful and provocative, man. That was powerful. Just stop and think about that role that brother played. Four different roles, man. And, and it has so much truth to it. How we are typecast in America, man. We're typecast. They give us very little choice. Some of us have been blessed, you know, to have a voice, to try to help others. And there are others, man, like that talented brother, Michael K. Williams, still after having success. And but he was having large success. He could not break away from those drugs. Anybody want to comment on that? Take it, man. Take it. I want to know how, how people feel about that performance there by Michael K. Williams. The, 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 um, <laughs> the characters who, who portrayed that piece were, were excellent. But again, we find that the, the system that has a plan to annihilate us has not been interrupted with a counter plan. So we can we continue to address conditions that has been created for centuries. <laughs> you find young brothers like CJ, the plan has already been set for him and those in his generation without a reference to what history really means to some young African-American youngsters who, who are endowed with skills and they would never be, they would never be identified for what they are or who they are. So they have to destroy the population that represents a threat. And as Malcolm said, by any means necessary, they got to get rid of this culture of people by drugs, by violence, by making accessibility guns, which is an instrument that has destroyed our way of thinking because we don't have a rest but to use the guns on one another because they don't shoot no crackers. No black police officer has ever shot a white man or a white woman. Law enforcement is trained to kill and shoot 
and take advantage of their own communities. The evidence is true. Okay. Uh, Vaughn, you want to add something to that? I, I quite agree with him, you know. Um, I still go back to my point of saying that uh, we have to find a way to, to, to develop uh, the attitude and the philosophy for advancement. Um, the, the, the challenges that we face seem to be insurmountable, but I think that individually, if we can corroborate with one or two, we can come together with a, a sensibility for advancement. You know, it, it is essential that that takes place. Because if we don't, we will continue to go down the same path um, that perhaps Michael Williams did and other peoples have done, you know. Um, you know, it's a, it's a real challenge we are facing. We are really facing this challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't have the answers, but I, I could just contribute. So each one of us who are sensible and, and consciousness is there can contribute to, to the step forward, I think it can go places, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I lean on the young people, work with the young people, collaborate with the CGs, with the Vanettas, and the, you know, um, it, the steps will go forward, you know, we will we'll advance, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's, my, that's my position, you know, to, to just continue the struggle, um, you know, stay away from the conflicts, and just advance the steps forward, uh, step by step, and, and and move on. You know, I think another mm -hmm. important thing is is documentation. We we must document our history. You know, right. if we don't do it, others will write it, and will, it will be their story, his story. Yeah. So for us, we must document what we have done, where we have come forth. And, and so forth, you know, it's essential, definitely essential, you know. Hey, Deb, you want to come back in, Deb? Can you hear me, Deb? Come on back in, babe. Okay, Deb, come on. Well, I, I definitely agree with Vaughn in terms of um, collaboration, but I also see that we need to work closely together. So we have the seniors that have a lot of knowledge that can pass to the young ones and the young ones, some are anxious to listen and some are not because they think that they have the, the plan. Can you see me? The yeah. plan to, yeah, the plan to um, execute. Mm -hmm. And we really, really, truly need to work together cohesively so that things can get better. And if we don't, it just continues. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I see that um, in terms of uh, people, we have others that really want power and they're gonna just take that power and demise us. And I don't know how to change that because we have powerful people that are on top that are not really for our benefit. You know, so we all, again, still need to come together to work, to come with a solution or to develop a plan that would be beneficial for us. Mm -hmm. I want to, Michael, I see you there, Mike. I'm going to bring you back after this. Gary, can we go to that second part of uh, Michael K. Williams, which I think is powerful and very provocative, too? Let's okay, go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's see here. Um... Yeah, let's let's do that. Here we go. Michael has been um, nominated for uh, Emmy Award for his latest uh, Lovecraft Country, and he was talking about some folks that in this movie how they left one part of the country to go move to Chicago to find their own lives. And here's what he had to say about that. Yeah, ain't nothing to root for. Cold, Sean. That's good. What the hell y'all doing here? We're, we're here to save you. Try to save my damn self. 
I need y'all coming for me. The world that Lovecraft Country lives in is we are looking at the American experience through this black family. They've already survived the Tulsa massacre in 1921. They then moved to Chicago, the south side of Chicago, which is within itself kind of like moving to a war zone. And all of this is happening during Jim Crow America. So this is who they are when we meet them. And we follow them on their quest to find out who they are, who they are as a family, what is their legacy? What will they leave behind for their next generation? And they're trying to mend as a family. They're trying to heal old wounds and find ways to forgive each other, all while dealing with this horrifying monster that looms over them called racism. I think this project is super timely for the times that we find ourselves in right now. I do believe what the late great John Lewis said, which is, although we have far to go, we've come a long way. I saw that evidence in the protests for the murder of George Floyd, the diversity that was in the streets from white, black, male, female, young, old, gay, straight, Hasidic, Hispanic, everyone, Asians, everyone was in them streets chanting justice for George Floyd. And, you know, that, that was nothing I definitely had never seen before on that level. What's happening right now is we're looking at ourselves. We're, we're being stripped down naked to see exactly who we are as a nation. And in that, I'm reminded that, you know, America is a baby. We're still so young. You know, we're, we're, we're a baby with a very, very big, noisy rattle, but yet still a baby. So when we look at a black family today in regards to how poverty and community, you know, um, the breakdown of community, how all these things are put into play. We get glimpses of that in the, in the narrative of Lovecraft Country. I think this is a brilliant time. And, and for me as an artist, as an actor, what a great opportunity to have this piece of art, to be a part of this piece of art making that we can hold up as a mirror for us to take a look at ourselves as a nation. I think it's, it's, very timely. Um, yeah, that's a that's a tough loss, man, to uh, lose uh, Michael K. Williams. Um, some of you, I guess, most of you are aware uh, how Michael K. Williams really became uh, the big star that he did in The Wire. He played Omar, you know, a, a killer, and uh, he moved on from there. But as you can see, man, that uh, he is a talented, talented brother that will truly be missed. I want to go down to Selma, Alabama right now and bring in our friend, uh, attorney uh, Michael Jackson. Michael, where were you on 9-11? And tell us what you just thought of that piece, uh, Michael K. Williams, just uh, you heard. Uh, to be honest, I don't remember exactly where I was at 9-11. I remember watching one of these cable shows and seeing the planes crash into the uh, the Twin Towers. And I had a chance to uh, stay in a hotel a few years ago, right across from the new rebuilt hotel. And I was on like the 60th floor looking up. And that thing was so tall, I'm still looking, looking way up. I snapped the picture because it was just amazing at how tall that new building is. But Michael Williams, I used to watch the Y. I watched it all the way through a couple of times. Um, it's on HBO, and man, he did play a powerful uh, character with Omar. And I did want to, before I get into what he was talking about, I wanted to mention. Uh, Robert Smith just died. A lot of folk don't know him, but he was he, he was the ex-district attorney in Hines, Mississippi. A black guy who went through all kinds of struggles. Uh, the attorney general was trying to prosecute him. They went to trial multiple times. He, uh, he eventually got off and because uh, it kept being hung juries and that type of thing, but he eventually got off and he ran for governor. And he ended up working in the Cochran firm. And I talked to the guy about a few months ago. He called me. I just learned he died in a car wreck. So I did want to mention that Robinson out of Mississippi, the district attorney. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, CJ, um, there's a piece that you uh, have you want to put with us um, on Donovan Mitchell from the NBA. And he took a stand uh, as far as politicians are concerned and about racism in Utah. Tell us about that, CJ. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Donovan Mitchell, yeah. So he was in the news, basically, the Utah legislature. It's, it's um, ironic. We were talking about education and learning our Donovan history Mitch- and being more... And let me hold the CJ. Let me make this clear. Donovan Mitchell is my cousin. I, I don't want to let that go by. Go ahead, CJ. <laughs> Absolutely. He's got those good genes, uh, the social conscious, socially conscious, but at the same time. So, yeah, the story is basically that the Utah is trying to pass these similar laws that they have in other um, states like Florida, where they're trying to ban critical race theory from being taught into schools. But what they don't really tell you and what the Republicans, which is so weird about this movement, is like no one's really trying to teach critical race theory. That's something that's usually taught like post-grad school. So it's not something that they're trying to indoctrinate kids. But when Republicans try to block critical race theory, what they're trying to actually block is anything in the history books that makes white people look bad, basically, which is a whole lot of just actual history. So that is problematic. They're trying to whitewash even further the history books, which are already pretty whitewashed and come from the perspective, you know, uh, from that perspective. So what had happened was Donovan, Donovan Mitchell had gotten involved into blocking the bill that they were going to block critical race theory. And um, some of the state representatives of Utah were not very happy with him. And they dropped his name, you know, by name saying, oh, the Utah Jazz, and the Utah Jazz apparently had his back. So props to the Utah Jazz for having their star players back in, in this issue. But at the same time, they were complaining. But what, rubbed, what made it news and what rubbed people the wrong way was those politicians were on tape. And I, I've got the video on Twitter, or they're saying that they – that Donovan Mitchell knows not what he's doing because he needs to be educated on the issues. And uh, that's why, and they just assume a young black man, it doesn't have the education to know what he's talking about when Donovan Mitchell is completely correct in this instant of trying to not have the history books even further whitewashed than they already are. Cause I went to school, you know, not too long ago. And those, they give you a pretty white wash perspective as it is. So, these bills to block critical race theory are not blocking critical race theory. There's no movement on the left or anywhere I see to cre- teach critical race theory to elementary school kids. It is just history as we know it, which is, you know, it, it doesn't always paint white people or conservatives in, in the best of light, but that's just history. That just is what it is. Slavery happened. All types of atrocities happened and they need to be taught about. So that, and we, we can't be censoring history so we never learn from our mistakes, basically. Yeah. Uh, see, they did. Did you have that video of the? Of I the, do. You do have the video. This. Yep. Uh, let's show that video of him addressing uh, Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell is a rising star in the NBA, one of the top players in the NBA, and uh, a cousin of mine. So I'm very proud of him taking that stand. I'm glad that CJ brought it to my attention. Yeah. Also, Alec is a terrible organization. They are a huge lobbying firm, but they end up have like having corporations write bills for these politicians that they don't even look at and they pass through the floor based on who donates to them. So these this is a, a sleazy environment in itself. But here, here's the video. Labor- laboratories of uh, democracy. And, and that's just not a phrase. It's the truth. We copied Minnesota's abortion bill. I think we've joined in your lawsuit. And so it, it, Mississippi, I mean, Mississippi's bill, and we've joined with them when they're, they're lawsuits. So, uh, and then we tried to do something similar to, uh, to Florida, uh, and Mississippi. Uh, it, it made it through the House, came to the Senate. We thought we had it done, but then there was pretty good backlash from the Jazz and other sports organizations and the NBA. And it stalled in the Senate, I hate to tell you that, but it did. Uh, we, I mentioned during the general session, we, we passed resolution uh, trying to ban critical race theory because the governor wouldn't put it on our call yesterday. We, we did it as a resolution. Uh, I just got a text last night, and I hate, to, I hate to use names, but I will. Donovan Mitchell is not happy with us. And you start to get, uh, you start to get very popular sports stars like that that are pushing back. We've got work to do to try to educate them. And my text back was, 
let's get after him and let's go tell him what we're doing because they don't really think he understands what happened. But it is a, it is a problem. It's not something that uh, we've seen a lot in Utah, but I think it is a big issue and we're, we're going to deal with it. Uh, what, he, what he's telling Donovan Mitchell to do is shut up and dribble. You know, that's, that's what he's telling. Sport, the athletes, black athletes are not supposed to have any conscience. So when Donovan Mitchell is young, uh, Donovan's only about 24 years old, who stepped to the plate, man, and said, hold, hold it, stop this right, right here, and stop them dead in their tracks. And they can't get over that. So I take my hat off to, uh, to Donovan and, and other black athletes like him saying, enough is enough. You know, we're running out of time, <clears throat> but I want to go around and give everybody a, a minute as we go out of here. I'm going to let, uh, of course, Gary close out the show. He has uh, a couple of things that he wants to say. Let's start at the top. Uh, take a minute, uh, Vaughn, and close out. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me because this certainly um, gave me a, a tremendous amount of enlightenment uh, as the struggle advances, it points out that um, you know we are not alone in our efforts to to advance uh, the, our cause, and therefore um, I congratulate you, Harold and Gary and CJ and all the rest of individuals who have participated here. Uh, again, I just go back to my point: is that we we really have to to stay together, collaborate more, work together and um, advance our, our efforts to the cause, you know. Um, this discrimination, this racism isn't going to go anywhere. Um, it, it's not going to advance our cause. And we have some of our own people who are contributing to the problem. So therefore, those of us who are, are rigid in our thought patterns and our, our objectives need to just work together, collaborate, work together and advance the, the, the steps forward. Um, it, it's, a, it's a lonely journey sometimes, but I think it's worth the while, you know, because when we think of our ancestors who came all the way, who were brought all the way from Africa and settled in places we didn't know, uh, you know, when we think of the people who left America and settled in Trinidad and they established their own places of land called Americans, um, they contributed, they spent, they, they expressed parts of their lives in, in a struggle and an advancement forward. So I think we at this stage, we have to continue, you know, prepare, hand the mantle over to people like CJ and Vanetta and others, and let's move on, let's continue the struggle. I mean, at the end, there will be solutions, there will be a step forward, there will be a, a place where we can call our own, you know. Um, in the whole process, we must also write our own history documentation is critically important uh, and that's where i am thank you very much Harold. okay deb come on back in deb deb you got a minute there close it out for us please <laughs> okay take yourself off mute take yourself off mute okay okay oh because i'm using two phones so i want to make this He's still on mute, look like it. Okay. Well, I'm using two devices. Okay. Again, I want to thank you for including me in this uh, discussion. Okay. <laughs> okay. And um, particularly with 9 11 and knowing that if something else happens, I mean, again, this is 20 years that it had happened, but if it happens again, um, how are we as a unit or a community or a society to really work together? And I just see the disconnect, especially with the pandemic that's happening. Everybody has a different viewpoint on that, as well as the uh, discrimination that we have seen all the time. Um, so I'm glad that just having this discussion with amongst us um, and it's it's recorded to go back and to to give to our young people and just the community in general. It, it's very, very helpful. So thank you. OK, come back. Don't be a stranger. We're here every Sunday. <laughs> OK, no problem. OK. All right, Sydney. 
Take a minute, please. We run out of time. Sydney, are you going to be able to close out? Yeah, look. I'm saying each week we come face-to-face uh, -to, -face to deal with aspects of the truth. And we are still in search of a plan to defeat racism and all of the destructive forces that come against our communities, our families, the injustice metastasizes. George Floyd example is just one of the big, big, big waves of racism and injustice. However, that's been going on continuously and we still have yet to develop a plan. So I'd just like to say we need to talk about plans that would enhance our capacity and our strength as a God force. Okay. Uh, Michael, Michael Jackson, closes out. I just want to say real quick, 20 years after 9-11, we got a lot of division. We seem to be united back then, but we have a lot of division 20 years later. I think the key is going to be young people. And I think we, get, we have to emphasize reading to young people, reading books so they can critically think on their own. That's right. Okay, CJ, my co-host, great job, CJ. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think education is extremely important. And um, some points that were talk talked about earlier, if, if uh, a 9-11 happened all over again, well, it kind of has like um, more people have died yesterday of COVID than 9-11 total here in the attacks on, on the two towers. There's also white supremacists that do mass shootings all the time, crazy white shooters with AR-15s and things like that. So we, we face terrorism, you know, domestic terrorism all the time. As, as was stated before, we had a whole insurrection at our Capitol January 6th. So where someone died in that as well, and, and cops were beaten and things like that. So as, as until we can defeat the polarization of everything, we can't even uh, decide, as my dad talked about earlier, this, the country can't even come together on a free vaccine to a pandemic. Like well, that's become a political issue that that's divided us in half. So until we can stop making everything political and actually come together with some form of collectivism, as um, um, Mr. Jackson says, um, educating young people as well and old people, because it's not just the young people who are uneducated. It's the people in positions of power too that don't know a thing about the, the types of uh, issues that they're legislating on. So that there's an issue with that too. So until we really address those things at the grassroots and find some actual leaders to organize around, there's no leaders. There's no big entertainment. If, if this show was on, you know, primetime CNN or something, that'd be one thing. But right now, the number one um, news show on, on cable news is Tucker Carlson, and he's basically oh, a white nationalist. Jesus. Wow. So, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. So until we have the, that same sort of organization and leadership and rally around some figures of our own that we, we can trust and, and agree upon, then we're going to have issues because they're organized on the other side. Mm -hmm. You're right. You know, as we get out of here, I, I want to bring up one thing before I bring Gary in. You know, uh, Vaughn in, had, had hit on it about how we got to start uh, reading and writing our own history, man, because other folks are telling our history. You know what I'm saying? And I want to remind folks that uh, on the 17th this Friday, I'm going to be on uh, Merlin Public Television. Uh, previewing uh, this documentary by Ken Burns on Muhammad Ali. He's doing a four-part series on Muhammad Ali. Now, once again, somebody else is telling our history. But I'm going to, I'm honored to be there because being a personal friend of Muhammad Ali's, I know the real Muhammad Ali. What I have ain't, ain't nothing something that I heard. I something that I know. And we got to stop allowing folks. Uh, to tell our history. See, I made a stand years ago that anytime someone wrote something about me and it wasn't true, that I was going to fight back. 
And I've been able to do that over the past four or five decades. And when you write something negative about me, you better believe you go hear from Harold Bell. And, and several uh, years ago, there was this uh, guy by the name of David uh, McKenna out of the city paper. I was trying to help this brother, Earl Lord, who was the first black to play in the NBA. But they had blackballed him. You understand? For whatever reason, they blackballed him. They gave him no credit. So he came to me and said, Harold, I need to help for you to help me to get in, you know, into the NBA Hall of Fame, you know, where he belonged, you know. So what happened, I went out and I got Red R back, who was the godfather of the NBA. Red and I were real close. And then I got John Lewis, a congressman, to join us. I got John Lewis to write a letter uh, to Earl Lord saying that he was looking forward uh, to uh, assisting him to get into the Hall of Fame. So I did a thing for Earl Lord at Bowling Air Force Base, and I did a tribute during Black History Month to kick everything off to get him prepared to go into the Hall of Fame. Well, this guy, Dave McKenna, who wrote for the city paper, covered the event. And this is what he said in the story that he wrote. He said, last week, Harold Bell, the sports talk show host, sports writer, do-gooder, an all-around rebel rouser threw a party to honor Earl Lord, the NBA's first black player in a crowded ballroom at Bowling Air Force Base. Folks who remember Lord from his days across the river at Parker Gray High School in the mid 40s mingled with those who just wanted to be near the alarming, obscure, athletic pioneer who broke the NBA color barrier as a member of the National Capitals in 1950. Lord, for whatever reason, never got his due around his hometown through the years. And sadly, he still isn't likely to after this function. Local daily newspapers and television stations, along with major sports figures, all stayed away from the Tribune. They all got press releases, said Bell. Why didn't they come? Deep down, Bell knew, uh, Kenna said. The mainstream media, press, and jock didn't come because of him. Plenty of people, including some of the biggest names in town, wanted no parts of Harold Bell or anything that he was associated with. <laughs> now, here's a guy that wrote this in 1998. Guess what? Guess where Earl Lord is? He's in the NBA Hall of Fame. He has, a, they just put a statue of him in Alexander, Virginia. They just put this poster that you're looking up and looking at at Uline Arena. So, but this guy has never had the balls to say, Harold, I made a mistake and you were right. He's still around, you know, but he is still writing. So what you got to do, you can't let people, uh, what would you say, assass a character assassination. That's what he was doing to me. It's here I am, these years later, the Earl Lord is in the Hall of Fame. So, you know, thanks to Red Arback and John Lewis and those folks who came on the team to help Earl Lord. And I just want to say, man, that we got to keep fighting. We cannot give up. And we got to understand exactly who we are and what we came from. Gary, take it from there. I can um, probably sum up in maybe two minutes or less, one minute or less, actually. Common sense ain't that common. And there's a respected broadcaster named Dr. Harry Edwards. And I recall something Dr. Harry Edwards said about some guy named Harold Bell. He said, Harold Bell, your discs and videos of your programs belong in the new Smithsonian, Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African American History and Culture. I remember back then when the museum was opening up, Dr. Edwards said a wing of the new museum will be dedicated to the struggle in sports and will be titled Leveling the Playing Field. He's talking about you, Mr. Bell, when he says your work was a major force over the years in leveling the playing field, especially in terms of the struggle to define and project our truth. And that's what's usually associated with you truth whether people like it or not that's the bottom line and i will leave it there speak the truth that's what brings us here 
every Sunday, and that's what will bring us back next Sunday. I just want to say that remember that every black face you see is not your brother, and every white face is not your enemy. And no, you remember this now: you cannot soar with eagles if you're hanging out with chickens. <laughs> you cannot soar with eagles, man. So you know, be careful of the people that you hang around with. Make sure you guys are always on the same level. Until next Sunday, I'm Harold Bell, and you can color me gone. You can always find our Speak the Truth episodes on the website. Just go to the homepage or go to blackmeninamerica.com. Speak the truth. Be safe, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Harold Bell. My wife Hattie and I found the nonprofit organization in 1968, shortly after the riots that almost destroyed my hometown, Washington, D.C. The program caters to the needs of at risk children as it relates to social services such as education, law enforcement, drug abuse, gang related violence, and other anti social behavior. 